Thank you again to everyone for joining us today. My name is Glenn Engelberg, and I am the Assistant Director of Recruitment for the Global Energy Management, or GEM, program here at the University of Colorado Denver Business School. And the purpose of today's webinar is to discuss the unique features of the GEM program and really give you a more holistic perspective of how the GEM degree works on many fronts. Uh, specifically, uh, we're fortunate to have one of our alum as well as one of our faculty members here today, uh, Garrett Peterson and Dr. Michael Orlando, who will give some uh, unique perspective, stories, and insight on what it's like from the teacher as well as student side of the GEM program and a few other details here as well. Uh, now, a quick agenda for our webinar here today. We I will go ahead and begin with a very quick overview of the program because I know everyone's familiarity with GEM will be a little different as we only take a couple minutes here. Then uh, the majority of our time today will be spent on uh, the panelist discussion and some guided questions that we will have for them and followed by uh, a couple upcoming events, um, a couple things about the application process and as I mentioned earlier, well, we will have a little bit of time for a Q&A session here as well. All right, and um, one thing too as well, um, for the Q&A session, we will have a chat, uh, you should see a chat box. So if you have any questions, um, we will try to get to as many as we can toward the end of the webinar, but please feel free to go ahead and write them in there. All right, so um, to begin here today, um, before we get into some of the details actually about the GEM program, I really wanna make sure that we focus specifically on some of the items that uh, that you the audience here wants to know more about so i'm going to do a quick poll question here so if everyone could go ahead and do me a favor and take a moment uh, to read this poll question it's what would you most like to learn in today's webinar and you could choose one out of four answers the answers are anonymous uh, but this will help guide our discussion today so we will take a quick moment here for you to do this and uh, then proceed from there All right, looks like the majority of people have voted here. We'll wait for a couple more. And it's actually about pretty evenly distributed too uh, that we have here as well. So it uh, looks like um, actually it's pretty much um, right down the middle with um, gem value for energy professionals, details in the hybrid format and how to evaluate the risk reward uh, for going back to school um, now for energy professionals with uh, COVID-19 and everything going on. So, well, thank you to, to everyone here who contributed towards this. These are all topics we're gonna talk about today uh, to begin with, but we'll make sure to focus on, on a couple of them specifically as well uh, with that feedback. And as you can see here on, on, on the slide here today, that with the GEM program, it's not just a master's degree, but Really, we're an energy thought center and a hub here in Denver for energy education and networking. Uh, we provide professional energy education with certificate classes, public education with some free online Coursera classes and different forums that we participate in. Dr. Orlando actually is one of the um, one of the designers of one of the free online classes we have, and I'm sure we'll talk about that in a little bit. But we do a lot of different elements here, um, even some outside that actual master's degree. Now for the, for the Master's in, in Global Energy Management program too, what I really want you to, to take away from this is that Jim gives you really the business skills of an MBA plus the technical and energy specific expertise, all while allowing you the flexibility to work full time while you do the program. So as you can see here, it is a business and leadership degree designed for energy professionals with that and we have a couple certificates as well, but I think really understanding that What's unique about the program is that combination of uh, the MBA components, but those that are energy specific to prepare you for the, a career to grow in the energy sector and really all energy sectors as well. So with how we have the program here set up, we'll talk a little more about the blended curriculum and online learning here, but it is something that is flexible, but also very interactive. I know everyone has had a different experience, probably in the online format, some good and some uh, maybe not so good, but. Uh, regardless, um, we'll, we'll go ahead and try to paint more of a picture of how it works here today uh, with it, but it's something that is 
um, guided by a lot of uh, case studies, um, oriented group projects that have a purpose to them and very application-based work as well that we will have. And um, as you can probably see at the face there at the bottom left-hand corner, Dr. Orlando um, is one of the adjunct faculty that we are um, fortunate enough to have us join today. In addition to that, um, we have a couple other faculty members here that you can see as well, and many others too that aren't listed, but the reason I wanted to mention this is because they are all still heavily involved in the energy sector, typically working still full-time in a leadership position, so they understand the pulse of not just what's important, but how you can apply it um, now as well as in the future. And that's why we make sure that our curriculum is very current because our faculty members are still involved in really the heartbeat and pulse of, of the energy sector specifically. Now, just a couple examples here of career advancement uh, for the GEM program. And one thing I really wanna just kind of take away from this here is that GEM prepares you with a network and skill set for opportunities across all energy sectors. A couple examples here, you can see we've had students go from oil and gas to the renewable side, even to the utility, and ultimately I know we have one that works you know, at, at Lockheed Martin, um, or others go, you know, like the geologist we had two, who is now working as a US business operations manager, and many more, but you know, it, it prepares you for a lot of different opportunities and really all different sectors, or even sometimes a parallel transition to other energy sectors too. And I know Garrett and uh, Dr. Orlando will discuss that a little more today as well. All right, but I'm sure as, as lovely as you, as lovely as you may find my voice and discussing today, really with the, um, the, the stars of today's show are Dr. Michael Orlando and Garrett Peterson. So uh, I'm gonna go ahead and introduce uh, these two gentlemen here in a moment and uh, we will begin uh, the questions and conversation today. Um, and um, as you can see here, Dr. Orlando teaches a couple different classes here. Oh, and is currently the managing director at Econ One Research, and uh, Garrett Peterson um, is one of our a GEM alum and currently works as the VP of Project Development at Pivot Energy. Uh, so without further ado here, uh, gentlemen, why don't we go ahead and um, in introduce each of you. Uh, Garrett, why don't you go first, and then Dr. Orlando, you can introduce yourself, and we'll begin with some of the questions and conversation. Thanks, Glenn. Good afternoon. My name is Garrett Peterson. I'm the Vice President of Project Development at Pivot Energy. Uh, that covers about a 200 megawatt pipeline of commercial and community solar development and uh, a team of approximately 10 across the, the U.S. that um, is developing both, like I said, commercial and community solar projects. And I'm Mike Orlando. I am a managing director of Econ One Research. This is a, a national practice. We actually have, a, I think, offices in the UK and India, but um, uh, I'm managing director of the Denver practice. We're based in LA. Um, the firm really does litigation support, so a lot of you know, expert witness testimony for contract damage disputes. I'm working on an antitrust case right now. My practice tends to industry-wise focus a bit in energy and in oil and gas in particular. And then I also have been teaching with the GEM program since 2012, I believe. Prior to that, I was teaching at Tulane University um, in the Masters of Finance program, and prior to that, I assisted with developing some energy business content at Penn State, one of my alma maters. And then um, at in the GEM program, I teach the financial management core class, and I teach a political risk analysis and strategy class. And then uh, years ago, they enlisted me to help launch uh, CU Denver's foray into massive open online programs. So. If you go to the Coursera platform, you can find some University of Colorado courses in there. And the one that, um, the, the one of our programs that's on there that I teach is called Fundamentals of Global Energy Management. Wonderful. I like the term enlisted too. It makes it sound like a you know, <laughs> service over here. Yeah. Y'all, you can be, be in the GEM program, right? <laughs> that, so, I uh, know. Thank you so much. Yeah. And also, too, to let everyone know, I'll follow up with everyone here via email. So, if you um, can't find the link or need that for the Coursera, Coursera class or slides or anything like that, uh, you can reach out to me directly. I know um, everyone here has my email. So, 
just want to uh, mention that as well. So, all right, well, why don't we begin with a, a couple questions here. And the first will be for, uh, for Dr. Orlando. So, um, Dr. Orlando, I know you've worked, as you mentioned, with the GEM program um, since 2012 and have interacted with many alum in the energy community here too. What do you see as the biggest value for energy professionals that do the GEM program? Um, I think one of the values is just the diverse exposure that you get in this program in particular. Um, so I, I think it's diverse in two ways. One is the program is really targeted literally globally. So uh, like right now I have students from Africa and I typically over the years have had students from Canada and South America and uh, East Asia, uh, China, Bangladesh. Um, we've had students from Western Europe. So there's a lot of diversity in the sort of obvious regard, but one of the more unique things I think about the program is that the, is the diversity of, um, of uh, the diversity across sectors within the program that's represented. So when in the other programs I've taught in, they tended to be a little more focused in oil and gas in particular, perhaps or else they were completely non-specific type of MBA programs. So you have kind of a bit of common interests, but you definitely are exposed to the entire um, broad energy, set of broad energy sectors. And I, I think that's really interesting because the reality in the businesses is that there's a lot of interplay between those sectors. Even if there's not direct interplay, the markets are constantly affecting each other. No, no, absolutely. That, that, that's a, a really good point. And I know too, as well, with the way our program is set up, it's sometimes really helpful uh, to have, I know from a lot of our students and feedback to understand perspectives and be exposed to those perspectives that you not normally would get on a daily basis, because it can be easy to kind of be tied into our specific niche, right? Mm -hmm. We're worried about what we're doing, but kind of help broaden those horizons, not just from a network standpoint, this knowledge and, and problem solving too. So, well, great. Well, thank you. And I just to shift here to a little bit about the student perspective, Garrett, uh, can you talk a little bit about your experience uh, working full time while being a GEM student? I know just, I mean, personally with a lot of the prospective students I speak with, that's probably one of their top concerns is how do I balance, you know, going back to school while working full time, family, et cetera. So maybe if you can talk a little bit about the flexibility of GEM and how that helped balance your schedule, I'm sure that, that would be appreciated. Yeah, the, the student perspective of going back to school while working full time, I think seems daunting at first, but you become much more proficient at scheduling, um, I, I guess, allocating family time, work time, your regular job, study, all of that. Um, I was able to structure mine in such a way that I worked basically during the day, did lessons at night, and then homework and group projects on the weekend. I know other people have uh, a different schedule or maybe they did things in the morning um, or I, I know that the professors take into account that you're actually working where we had an attorney in our group who had a very very heavy case for basically three weeks he really didn't do anything but that was completely fine because they knew that he had to focus um, same with somebody else who was uh, on uh, oil and gas rigs and for two, every two weeks, he was more or less out of touch and would do most of his work during the two weeks that he was off the rig. Mm -hmm. The first quarter will probably come as a shock, but after that, you fall into it and you, you find your rhythm and you can definitely manage the full time. Uh, I personally got married in the middle of uh, the cohort, so that was, that was an added stress of it, but entirely possible yeah well I know that's uh yeah actually I, I just celebrated my four four year anniversary I can still remember all the fun and nuances of wedding planning so god bless you yeah <laughs> that and, and make it a work but actually I'm curious on that too Garrett as well maybe just before we get to the, the next question here when you said um kind of the the first quarter or you know the first um session being I guess kind of eye-opening what was it I guess in particular that was you know just frankly the most difficult adjustment uh for you or the hardest thing uh when you were getting back into school mode the hardest thing was actually going back to school and realizing that you were doing it full time. <laughs> you know, it's, it, it's the programs for working professionals. So you're, you're used to working and you know, everything that that entails, but then 
add in 20 plus hours a week of lessons and lecture and, and going back and doing homework. And yeah, it's an adjustment. So, but again, it's, it's completely manageable. Yeah. No, uh, Glenn, can I, I want to comment on Please. that and I want to hear Garrett um, if he agrees or disagrees, but one of the things, you know, I'm kind of speaking out of turn and speaking for Garrett, but one of the things I notice is that to, to what Garrett was saying, I think students sometimes, because they're already working professionals, they kind of at least first come in thinking, this is going to be like a whole bunch of those weekend workshops that we go through at work, right? Where, you know, it's kind of a hassle to stay awake, but you basically learn stuff and then you leave and that's it. And I think what Garrett is saying is it's actually really school, even though it's designed to be built around the schedules and demands of working professionals, it still is legitimate you know, accreditation process and we have learning objectives and we have assessments that, you know, and we have assignments. And so that's the part, even though it's this hybrid format, that's the, I'm guessing Garrett, that's the part that was the shock <laughs> to you. <laughs> I, would, I would say the biggest shock is when you look at the syllabus and see what you're doing on a weekly basis. Yeah. And, and then you leave after those first four days that are, you've just been kind of inundated for, 10 plus hours a day for four days straight and you go home and you, you kind of let it all sink in and you go, Oh, okay. Yep. How, will, how will this get done? <laughs> yes. Yep. I'll tell you how it gets done now. Actually, you know what, when you said you gave uh, some slack to the, the guy who was offshore in my office hours last night, I literally had one of my students call in from a deep water drill ship. Yep. So now uh, information communication technology has gotten so cheap. We can find you everywhere. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> Accessibility uh, with that too. Yeah. So I, I know I've been even different students that were even doing, uh, you know, hunting and in between, you know, we're doing assignments and stuff and all, all kinds of, you know, things as well. So there's, uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, there's a way to go about it. But um, well, that, that's helpful too. And, and actually, um, to kind of talk a little more about some of the financial perspective and that side, um, Dr. Orlando, as you probably know, Jim offers a couple of graduate certificates, including a global energy financial management certificate. Um, since you do teach some of these classes that touch on this as professionally, you know, have a lot of experience with the economics and finance of the energy field, can you talk a little more about the value of these courses on the financial side of energy? Well, I think, you know, within this program and for these students and if in this industry, you know, one thing that's interesting about energy is that we do really technically complicated, difficult things. And so naturally, most of the people in the industry have to be pretty sophisticated and pretty deeply knowledgeable within their field. I actually have an undergraduate, as you know, in petroleum engineering. So that was a pretty rigorous four years of my life. It was one of the highest credit requirements at Penn State when I went through that experience. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, energy businesses are just like any other business. They are money machines, right? Even in a day of ESG, uh, of in, if for anyone who doesn't know that acronym, it's, uh, you know, concerns about environmental, social, and governance criteria that are increasingly built into the governance uh, systems and goals of an organization, even in a day where we are very concerned about that stuff, and rightly so, at the end of the day, for, a, for a, any business to be sustainable, it needs to deliver payments to whoever loaned it money, and it needs to deliver enough of a return to the owners so that they keep their money invested in it, or they can't do anything good or bad right? They just can't do anything. So one thing I think that students take away from at least that set of courses and, and what I try to get through in my course is frankly less about the technical details, even though there's plenty of, as Garrett can attest, plenty of technical details to go over in the class. But what I really want them to take away and remember in the long run is the strategic function of finance and the financial perspective of an organization. And if if you want to really understand how, whether you're going to go into a financial function or not, you want to understand how to optimize your contribution within an organization or your organization's impact in the world, you have to really have this financial perspective and see where your efforts 
trickle all the way down through that basic incentive system, that governance system, which is the financial structure, and allows the organization to be sustainable. No, no, absolutely. No, I think that that's absolutely critical. And I think that's one of the reasons why we ensure that a lot of our heart instructors uh, like yourself, they're, they're still in the heart of pulse of us. They understand, well, how do these bottom lines work and how can we ensure that the skill set translates to that, right? Mm -hmm. Know with that as well, yeah. uh, too. So actually, and a quick side note as well, I did see uh, a couple questions come in. One of them I should, I will be able to answer pretty quickly here. So I want to address regarding the certificates. So regarding the graduate certificates here, just so everyone knows, there are two. Uh, that are three classes each, and those classes do transfer into the master's degree. So if you, let's say, do those three classes, then decide you want to do the master's after that, those are three classes that would transfer to the master's, so then you would have nine classes versus 12. So I just want to quickly answer one of those questions from the audience with that there. Um, so well, getting uh, back to a little bit maybe more about the student experience too, um, Garrett, I'd like you to comment on this first, and then uh, Mike as well. Um, obviously, right now with COVID-19 going on and, and classes, at least the prefaces too here with Jem, are virtual, uh, at least for uh, the summer, and it looks like there's a good chance in October too. Uh, we're hoping, like many, that back uh, in, a, in a few months or so when things are a little more normalized, that we'll have those cohort weekends like you had, Garrett, uh, which are the first four days that really kick off each quarter here, and you do a lot of your live in-person lectures, group projects, some of those components. So. Can you talk a little more about that, Garrett, with, um, with how GEM's online format kind of worked in conjunction uh, with the cohort weekends and really just how you overall got the most out of, out of your experience with that and the online format? Yeah, and, and I think when this, you, you really hit the nail on the head where this relates a lot to what's happening now with COVID. Um, all of your group meetings, all of the lectures, all of the discussion boards, even office hours, like Dr. Orlando pointed out, are online and, and they've been online for some time. So I think it makes the GEM program uh, transition that much easier. I also, I also noticed that just being home in the last two months, the amount of meetings that have, have taken place versus in person, uh, connecting with people in New York or California, et cetera, this is going to become the norm. And I think the GEM program is ahead of that. And I went through the, the cohort in 2016, and I'm sure Dr. Orlando can attest that things have evolved since then. So the GEM program has really been pushing the online aspect of it for the, the duration of the program. Yeah, absolutely. Oh yeah, Mike, um, yeah, you, uh, you hear it all. Yeah, I, what I would say is one of the things that I liked about the program, of all the programs I've been involved with, one was fully online. Uh, one was a, a professional program like this, but we really didn't use the online a lot. We were really in person for long intensive weekends and then, you know, maybe people emailed me assignments, but we didn't really um, leverage the technology. I really like, and I, I hope, um, the, you know, the public health situation changes over time to allow us to go back to true fully hybrid. But I think with that tradition, even during a, a, a somewhat shut in lockdown period, even if it's individually chosen lockdowns <laughs> instead of by policy, you know, we have this, this uh, culture already institutionalized where we're really um, we see the program as having this in-person and online format. So for instance, I have, I say two meetings a week so far in the finance class that I'm currently teaching that are in person. And frankly, I'm doing more in-person stuff throughout the entire quarter than Garrett might recall because we didn't have that first weekend. So the first weekend we did online in person, I trimmed down my lectures because everybody being at home, you know, having to let the dog out or take a phone call or feed the kid makes it a little harder. So we build the program around the new realities of doing the synchronous aspect with those demands that are impinging on you rather than doing the synchronous aspect in person where we had your full attention and none of the distractions. We, we've been able to adapt to that and I think it's working pretty effectively. The one thing that it's changing in a weird way is I might be actually, uh, in real time interacting with my students even more than under the under the original format because I'm a little more concerned about 
how we didn't have that time up front. And I think the other teachers are probably being a little bit more accessible in that way also. I used to have, for instance, one office hour a week. And now I'm probably having, I still have that live office hour. It goes a little longer than normal. And I have my probably one team meeting a week at least, um, you know, with a subgroup of the class. So I think, uh, as Garrett mentioned, we were really set up because of our history and our design in the first place to adapt to this probably better than most of higher education. And I think we also knew what would what works online versus works in person. So we were able to change those things and adjust, probably get up that learning curve faster as well. And one thing, sorry, I was muted there. Uh, one thing to comment on that as well, too, to give some perspective, the GEM program's been around since 2008. I think 2009 was our first cohort, and we've been hybrid online since the very beginning. So I think as Garrett and Mike mentioned, too, we were better prepared than most and fortunate, um, you know, to have a little bit of a smoother transition with this. But, um, but yeah, but I think as Dr. Orlando mentioned, that he has the same spirit that a lot of our instructors do, whereas that they're willing to help go the, the extra mile and make sure that our students get the most out of it. They really do deeply care about seeing our students through it, you know, professionally, personally. And I know I've heard from a lot of feedback too from um, some students here that have had a transition for our April and July classes uh, online. That's actually been uh, a surprisingly smooth, you know, uh, transition. And that's a testament to, uh, to our faculty and the fact that we've been doing this for a little while too. So no, thank you for that perspective. Um, well, just to switch gears here a little bit um, here, Garrett, I'd like to, um, go back to you. Can you talk a little more about some of the group projects and how that was helpful to consider all the stakeholders involved when collaborating on different scenarios? And if you have specific examples to share too, I'm sure the audience will love to hear that. Yeah, so, um, you know, the group projects are great because you're going to interact with somebody who is not necessarily within your energy industry. Uh, you might have an attorney for Excel Energy. There may be a, a landman on your team, maybe somebody from finance or other aspects of um, the energy space. And when collaborating with somebody and, and working through those group projects, you, you realize so many different um, kind of stakeholder viewpoints that have to be considered. And, and I think it's it's uh, just a great perspective to be able to see how other indus industries view things and um, take yourself outside of your own industry's kind of silo of, well, this is how the renewable space would look at this, or this is how the uh, oil and gas space would look at this. Just bringing in different viewpoints is, is a really um, helpful, helpful learning tool. Yeah, no, absolutely. And... Um... And I think even on that note, too, to kind of piggyback off that for a little bit with the different stakeholders, understanding how all these vantage points work, you know, sometimes, you know, group projects can get, um, let's say, maybe not the best reputation, right? Where I'm doing 90% of the work and these three other chumps are doing 5% of, you know, that kind of thing <laughs> that, there as well. Um, I, you know, I'm sure if, if maybe both of you can talk a little more about that, can you just describe a little more detail how, how we're able to kind of ensure accountability so... On the group projects we have, it's a relatively even distribution, so everyone still gets something out of it without feeling like they're doing the majority of the work. So I don't care if you want to maybe comment on that first, and Dr. Orlando, um, I'd love to hear something that you just mentioned on that too. Yeah, you know, to be honest, the, the issue I had with the group projects was working in a group of any energy professionals, there was a tendency of for people to want to take on more. Like, I'll, I'll do that aspect, that one, that one, that one. And you kind of had to divide things, you know, apart. And, and sometimes you do have the aspect of one person, maybe they just want to present. They don't do, want to do a whole lot else. But um, there's an independent scoring system in, in your group that at the end of it, you submit something to your professor saying, I, w I worked well with this person because of these reasons I feel like they took on their load. There is some sort of uh, kind of peer recognition to the group projects. So it's, it's not a, well, the whole group got an A, there you go, you all get A's. There's, there is a factor to self-scoring and then within the group scoring. Yeah, so it's like, like a built-in kind of accountability. And Dr. Orlando, I'm not sure if there's anything um, else you'd like to add to that. 
Yeah, I mean, so I can tell you, like, I was just thinking about it. Um, in my class that I'm teaching now, I think, I think it's something like 12 and a half to 15% of the group project, you know, just to get in the weeds, is to what Garrett is saying is um, peer assessed. So one part of individual accountability is that the peers are assessing each other. But you know, the flip side is the reason that executive programs and business programs emphasize the group, the group requirement so much is because the reality is those problems that you worry about, the free rider problems or the one person taking on too much and not sharing the responsibility problems on the other end of the spectrum, that's part of the workforce. I mean, to really leverage yourself within an organization and get things done, you have to figure out how to work in that environment. And so this is an intentional part of the learning process. And it's something that people should look at, you know, even though there's no way to really take a group assignment and fully parse it down to individual contribution. Well, that's exactly how an organization works. Unless you're going to be the Lone Ranger, there's really no way to leverage an organization's you know, uh, intellectual and financial capacity, but somehow parse it down to every individual's contribution. So, so um, you know, that I think that's an important part is recognizing in a program like this, unlike if, if you went to a master's of fine arts program to be the best sculptor in the world, and it's gonna be all alone, <laughs> like in a program like this, you are going to, uh, you should kind of look forward to the challenge of learning how to work people with, with people with different perspectives and understand getting a reality check on maybe you're not the, the smartest genius in the room on every single dimension and understanding your strengths and capabilities and how you leverage those within a, within a group. Uh, that's part of, of learning to work better in a group and also become a leader, which is kind of the point of going through all of this. Yeah, no, no, absolutely. And I think that's, that's a great, um, that's a great perspective on that. Just understand kind of the, the quality of students that are in the program too, you know, as well. They're not here because they have to, they're here because they want to, they want to learn more about that. So I think they want to, you know, participate as Garrett was mentioning. And I see we did have a couple more um, questions pop up on the Q&A. Um, they're a little bit of longer answers. So I think we'll have time to get to them towards the end, but just wanted to recognize that. And to shift gears here a little bit too, I know we talked a little bit about the COVID aftermath and obviously the state of the energy economy, specifically oil and gas. You know, it's, obviously a, it's, a, it's a tough time right now. There's no doubt about it and no sugarcoating that. So mm -hmm. I know one thing I've heard a lot about from students is, you know, you know I'm interested in starting gym, but kind of concerned about the, um, the economy, the COVID aftermath, don't know what to do. Um, I guess, you know, uh, Garrett first and then uh, Michael, if you don't mind commenting on this, um, how would you tell them or like if they were asking you about this, what would you tell them about how they could use GEM to retool and maybe kind of more take control of their future in, in the energy sector? Yeah, I think the great part about the GEM program is you are making yourself more employable and you are becoming more educated as a whole across the energy industry. Um, you, you're going to learn aspects of finance, actual science of energy, economics, um, how utilities work, how does, you know, why does the, the price of a barrel of oil affect what happens in your 401k? Um, how do you write a contract? How do you uh, give a good presentation to an executive board? And all of these things are, are making you more employable and allowing you to go across an industry or even within your own company. If you're working for a very, very large company, maybe a position opens up that's lateral or a promotion. And just what you've learned in the GEM program, even in the beginning, I think makes you more confident, more knowledgeable, and more impactful in whatever role you're in. So it, it definitely seems like a risk you know, especially now, what do I do? The, the economy looks a little bit crazy. Well, there's going to be job openings because of this. Um, and those who are better suited to play, I think, kind of a, a jack of all trades type of role are going to be the ones that, that land in the right positions. No, no, absolutely. Um, Mike, would there's uh, anything you'd like to comment on that as well? Well, I mean, the maybe two quick things I would say is number one, no one can speak to the particular 
personal financial or family life stresses that people are going through in a situation like this. So that's not something we can really comment on. And those are entirely serious, important factors that everyone has to balance for themselves on whether they can afford it, whether they can afford the time, whether they have to take away time from their families. I mean, my, my brother just texted me this morning about one of our buddies back in, in New York just tested positive. These are real issues that we all have to, you know, all struggle with individually. What I would say, though, to, you know, maybe to underscore what Garrett's saying is that the reality is in, and we'll probably never see something like this in our lifetime again, hopefully. <laughs> what, <clears throat> what um, the reality is huge shocks like this do present opportunities, and they're exactly the kind of times when you you know, if you're going to ever be able to retool and change and, you know, the, the deck of pecking order gets shuffled a little bit and you, you want to be able to, to kind of have your hand up and say, I'm ready to do that thing, uh, that next task that, you know, is maybe no one ever thought about before or you never would have thought of me for before, in a shock like this, this is exactly the time when you do have an opportunity to make those transitions and distinguish yourself. So, I've, uh, you know, there's typically when there's not quite the devastating economic impact of this one, when you would see a secular downturn, you'd see enrollments in business schools go up on average because the opportunity cost of just laying out for a year or two and going into business or going and studying is probably less. In this particular case, I also think that the literal structural transformation of so many businesses is changing. And so this is an interesting time to really take to scratch your head and say, huh, what does it mean to run a restaurant? What does it mean to sell solar panels? What does it mean to, like, what do we worry about when we worry about improving energy efficiency? What does it mean to run an entertainment venue? All of these things are literally being dramatically transformed before our eyes, and this is a maybe a good opportunity to be in a in a setting where you can really think about those transformations in a deep fundamental way rather than just at the margin because you're rushing every day to get your job done, and now what people are willing to pay for or how many people show up at the you know ring your phone each day changed and so you kind of tweak a little bit of what you do that to me it's a good time to think deeply about about what we do yeah no absolutely and it's definitely time for reflection just understanding you know what you know what kind of skills that do i have you know what do i ultimately want to do with it and of course it's on a case-by-case -case basis to everyone's situation you know it's definitely different there so i appreciate that well i guess kind of um on a similar note too as well i know this is one of the questions that we presented in the in one of the polls earlier is that you know many prospective gem students that uh, that I'm working with or speaking with are also looking at like kind of like MBA type degrees. Um, and Dr. Lando, I know as you've uh, worked with several different programs too, um, I was hoping can you describe a little bit maybe how the gem program is different versus let's say an MBA with an energy focus. And then um, after that, Garrett, if you want to comment on that as well, I'm sure the audience would love to hear your take too. Um, I think the gem so for a normal for a kind of conventional mba which interestingly are are the things that seem to be going away the fastest um i think one of the differences is our is an industry specific focus so even though we're going to cover a lot of the fundamentals and certainly in my class i'm kind of obsessive about the fundamentals uh i probably spend more time trying to come up with with examples and kinds of contextual illustrations that are more relevant to the group. And it's also easier for me to do that because the group is concentrated, has a concentrated set of interests. Um, uh, and as compared to MBAs with an energy focus, I think that what you'll find in the GEM program is that that, ener that attention and, and uh, instruction and exposure to to specifics about the energy industry is built in earlier. I, I would think of most energy energy emphasis type of MBAs is you're gonna really go through largely a core curriculum and you're going to have a couple and you're gonna have a very diverse set of colleagues and you're gonna have a couple of classes towards the end um, where you know, you're 
possibly with a subset of those colleagues focusing on it or maybe throughout the program you're going to fully go across campus and go to you know to an engineering class with none of your colleagues so i i think we probably integrate that that material sooner um and more more deeply throughout the throughout each of the courses i think is how i would describe the difference Great, great. And I guess, uh, Garrett, do you have anything that you'd like to add to that just in terms of from the student perspective, maybe when you were looking at different programs, why you chose GEM or speaking to others about this versus the MBA kind of thing? Yeah, I, I look at it in two ways, Glenn. You know, the student perspective and the career perspective. The, the ability for the GEM program to, like I said, function online and have you live, say, not have to move for school or anything like that is an incredible value. Um, I looked into a lot of programs that were a master's of science. The University of Oklahoma is one that sticks out it, heavily, heavily centered on oil and gas. Um, I like the broad view that the GEM program brings for renewables, for uh, utilities, other aspects of the program. Uh, not to knock the University of Oklahoma or anything like that. It's just knowing kind of what your role or what your career path is going to be. Uh, I personally, from a career development perspective, look at an MBA as something that if you're not heavily involved in the finance aspects of your company, you know, maybe if your ultimate career role isn't to be like CFO or something, uh, work in energy trading or, or something like that, the masters of science that creates a broad understanding of the industry is more valuable. I have day-to-day -day interactions with both our finance team and external finance parties that are doing uh, purchasing solar assets, you know, hundred million dollar transactions. I understand the aspects of what they're doing, why COVID just drove up their cost of capital by, you know, a hundred basis points, things like that. I, I understand that from the general program. I don't need, to dive into a 16 tab financial model, right? That to me is more on the MBA focus. So from a career perspective, knowing exactly what you wanna do is, is a big differentiator between the Masters of Science and an MBA. And I will say that uh, a lot of the energy specific MBAs that I've researched require you to uh, take the classes full time they're during the day, they're under standard campus schedules. If you couple the cost of that with not actually being able to work, that's an incredible, incredible um, amount of financial concern to take on. So the, the aspect of being able to remain working while improving your career prospects is, is a big one for the Masters of Science. Yeah, no, absolutely. And even um, just out of respect, yeah, to, I know we have, we got a few questions here just in, so I want to make sure we have time to address those. But just one thing that Garrett mentioned too as well that I think is important to highlight is that one of the common threads that students in our program have on top, you know, looking to grow their career, usually having a full-time schedule, is that whether, you know, the, and the majority of them are already in their energy career and we have some that are segueing into it, they want to grow their career specifically in the energy sector even if they maybe don't know exactly where that is with it, and this program will help you know, them open up some opportunities and skill sets for that. I think that's the common thread and a, an important point that, that Garrett mentioned as well, so thank you. Uh, well, I do want to get to a couple other um, quick items here uh, regarding a little bit about the application process and admission side, and then we'll get right to our uh, a few questions I know we have from our audience too. So a couple quick things here want to that I want to highlight here in terms of application requirements and what the process is like is that it is very, very different from your undergraduate degree where you probably ended up uh, mailing out, you know, your application and waiting three to four months for a big envelope versus a tiny letter and how nerve wracking that was. I know at least for me, it definitely was. Here, it's a completely different process. It's much more guided and facilitated and actually much quicker too. Even with the turnaround of it as well, um, I work with students here. Um, some are able to complete their files in about one to two weeks. The turnaround's usually within about a week or two after that. And even um, with some of the components here, you know, with your essay, resume, some of these things here, and the GMAT score can be weighed based on energy experience too. Uh, you can connect with me and I'd be happy to go over details on that um, off the air. Uh, but it's a much quicker process. And even just to give an example, 
um, for our, our upcoming class that we actually have here on uh, that's um, here for fall starts on July 10th. We'll be working with students until June 30th. So that kind of gives you a quick I uh, an idea in terms of how quick the turnaround time is with it, especially because it will be online with that initial cohort weekend, but with registration, everything else, even financial aid stuff, it's a very quick process. So that's how we're able to, to turn it around quickly. And also, we've just been fortunate where we've had the program, it's been around for about 11, 12 years, have over 400 alumni, 500 plus students and alumni. So, um, you know, it's not our first rodeo, I guess you could say. Uh, one other quick thing too that I wanted to um, highlight before talking about a couple upcoming events and then a, a quick Q&A session here is tuition for the program. Uh, it's $54,000 for the entire degree, and that's the same if you're in-state or out-of-state uh, as well. And, you know, books can vary depending on if you get them from Amazon, you rent them, buy the new, used, um, and so forth. One thing I did want to mention um, as well is that I'd say probably the majority of our students in some form or fashion utilize financial aid. It is still available at the gradual level, even though there are some differences. Um, but also, I wanted to make sure that our students know, or prospective students too, that you don't have to pay everything at once. Um, usually there are payment plans are set up or you can pay as you go. I know a lot of you here today probably have some tuition reimbursement with your workplace and we work with a ton of people for that too. So there are some ways to kind of go about that. But when you ultimately compare our program to um, some other executive level um, energy business and leadership degrees, it actually is, um, you know, is pretty reasonable uh, in terms of the tuition and I think the value that our students get from it as well. Uh, now, just a couple upcoming uh, events here and things I want to highlight before going into some uh, questions we have from the audience here. We have some really good ones, too, by the way. Thank you so much for, uh, for your feedback. Um, one is, of course, as I mentioned, our upcoming fall class here um, will start on July 10th, and I am still working with students for that one. It will be until June 30th, so if you have any questions on that or maybe even if you're unsure about, well, I may be interested in the July class, but also the January one and unsure of what works best, connect with me and we have a lot of options to kind of keep both doors open to help out. So I'd be happy to connect with you off air on that. Um, also, one thing I want to really highlight is that, um, and thank you so much to Garrett and Michael here today too as well for their participation and their feedback and, and insight as well. Um, and in addition to that, to kind of take this a step further, for those of you that are interested in maybe connecting with another GEM alum, uh, to find out more just like one-on-one -on -one about what their experience was, ask them some questions, uh, you know, about um, their, you know, what, what their learning style was, what the experience was like, and just really get a better feel for it as you're comparing different options. We have a great thing called um, GEMS Virtual Coffee with Alumni, and I'll send everyone here a link after the webinar today too, um, but you can connect one-on-one -on -one with one of our uh, GEM alum um, and some scheduled times on Zoom to really get a more intimate look at it as you're looking at different options. So that's one thing I wanted to mention and, and we've had a lot of great conversations already from that as well. Uh, in addition, we have a fireside energy panel uh, returning to work post COVID-19 uh, and uh, our executive director, Sarah Dodowski will be one of the panelists for that. So just want to give a quick shout out there as well. All right, and then of course too, uh, if you have any questions or any, anything else, um, my phone number and email are there. As I mentioned, I will personally email everyone here at the end of the webinar, um, either later today or tomorrow. And we also should have a recording available too uh, that I'll send out to everyone as well. Um, but even uh, before that though, I know we have a, a few uh, questions here that I wanna make sure we can get to. So I'll just go through uh, some of them right now. Um, well, one question a student had is that, um, I, I work in oil and gas and I'm interested in transitioning to another field. How, I guess, how does that process work or how kind of common is it for students to go from oil and gas to maybe utilities or a, a different sector? Um, so, uh, well, I guess, um, Garrett, I'm not sure if you, because I know you work with a lot of different students there. I guess, can you comment a little bit on that? And then um, myself and Michael can do that as well. Yeah, um, I wouldn't say it's, it's necessarily an easy transition, but there are a lot of similarities I look at uh, an oil and gas land man and a solar project developer or wind developer. There's a lot of similarities between those two roles. Uh, working with landowners, working with uh, local permitting offices, title work, leasing, surface rights versus mineral rights. Uh, what is the environmental due diligence that's necessary to get a project moving? All of those are common threads between the two roles. And that's just one example. Now, somewhere 
where the GEM program comes in is you learn a little bit more about the differences in wind energy, what's the production tax credit, why does that matter, same with um, kilowatt hours, and selling into the wholesale market. Things like that are the small nuances that you learn, but right now, I've in the past month, I've had two different colleagues introduce me to people from the oil and gas industry who have actually been let go because of, obviously, the downturn in it. And um, trying to help in any way possible, but there's there's a lot of similarities in in the rules. So, I mean, I'm happy to. Glenn has my email. I'm happy to answer more questions about that or, or point out potential opportunities in the renewable industry that I think somebody in oil and gas maybe has a has a, a good transition into. Yeah, no, no, absolutely. Well, thank thank you so much, Garrett. I guess, um, and I, I have a couple of comments on that too, but beforehand, Dr. Lando, I want to give you a chance to uh, share a little bit. Yeah, of that so well. I would say, first of all, we've seen students make that transition. Um, we, we've especially seen students like, I know of one I keep in touch with specifically who moved from oil and gas, like Garrett's saying, land is a particularly <laughs> good one to transition from. He moved from oil and gas to, um, he actually moved to utilities, electric utility, and then he moved to um, aviation, actually. He's now in aviation. Uh, he's, he's with, um, I don't know, he's with one of the jet propulsion companies down, uh, down south. And um, I think one of the challenges I've noticed is that oil and gas pays pretty well. And what <laughs> one thing you learn in my class is there's a, there's a relationship between risk and reward. And the reason it pays so well is because it's pretty risky. And so a lot of times the holdup is people leaving oil and gas with its certain technical or business skill set, and it just doesn't get the same compensation in some other sectors. Well, part of the reason is because probably the the sort of flight path on those other sectors is a little longer and more steady. So I think it depends on your own expectations and your your it depends on what your what your ambition is, but also how realistic you are about understanding the other industry. I will say you probably are are kind of ahead of uh, in that line, if you have the exposure to the student group that we have, because it's much more diverse. Um, but the other thing is, you you also, by being exposed to the students, you, you kind of get a, a leg up a little bit, because whether you're trying to transition from one energy sector to another, or just enter the energy sector in general, I mean, I've had students completely outside the energy sector that are coming from entertainment, or they're coming from recreation industries, or uh, finance, I know we've had, right? Some others have done that. Yeah, consumer sales, uh, like retail sales type of, of things. And um, they want to transition in. And uh, I think that they, you know, understanding from not only what you get out of the program, but what is it uh, more generically about your background that I you know someone here mentioned education. What is it about the education function that you could bring into the, a, an energy sector business? It might be something like you realize, wow, in investor relations, they really need people who can communicate the reality of the business to the, you know, to the investors. And that is essentially an education function. Or sales is frankly an education function when you're dealing with very technical, technical um, things that you're trying to sell. So, <laughs> It depends, I, I would say that you can make that transition, but you need to be realistic about from one sector to the other in industry of, of what you're looking for. And you also need to really mine your own experiences beyond what you're getting out of the GEM program to think about what can I bring and make a credible story about my professional arc that brought me from this unrelated thing through the GEM program to sitting in an office of someone in an energy business. Yeah, no, that, that's a great point, actually. That was going to be one of the questions, too, and you, you kind of um, touched on that as well, Dr. Orlando, from one of our audience members who uh, was asking about transitioning from another sector to that. And I think it, the same principle applies, as you mentioned, to transitioning to a parallel sector. It's what skills do you have that in conjunction with that and make you unique can be parallel to the job opportunity, the network, and those things that, that we help with that. I know um, I can think of even a couple offhand, too, where instructors 
specifically help help with that transition too. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you know, with, with those sectors as well. So, uh, no, thank you. Well, actually, kind of on, on that note too as well. Um, and this uh, the question is for both of you uh, too. Um, that I think our audience would like to know about. And they asked, is that for someone like for someone like me that is living out of state, I'm a little concerned that the um, people in state will receive a little more value or return on their investment. Uh, can you go over maybe some examples of students out of state who've been able to, to utilize GEMS network or connections to help elevate their career? Uh, Dr. Orlando, if you want to comment on that first, then Garrett, if you have any examples of students that you um, from your class or work with, I'm sure we'd love to hear about it. Yeah, um, <clears throat> I was thinking about, I don't know if I should mention names, but I was thinking of, about this woman, I think she worked for Shell in London, and she wound up you know, she cites the GEM program as allowing her to really adapt herself and move out of the specific narrow technical role that she was pursuing. Oh, early on when I taught, there was a woman who was here, but she got transferred to uh, um, Australia and she immediately plugged in as a, um, I think part of the reason she wound up getting that job is it was a management job, a technical management job, but being able to cite some of the leadership uh, skills that she was developing through the GEM program um, was useful. Um, I mean, I don't, you know, there, I, my understanding of the demographics is we're probably on average about 50% in the Denver metro or Colorado more broadly. Yeah, speaking. roughly about half, maybe a touch over Colorado, yeah. Like yeah, just. so that's, and it, it varies. Some years it kind of is less, but sure. I usually think of it as about 50% Colorado wide and then probably about another 25% nationwide and probably about 10 to 20%, you know, global outside of, of the U.S. And I think a lot of it winds up, you know, because of our, our program is so online, um, I don't know that the, you know, when you start talking about the globe, it's a big place. So I don't know whether you have, you know, all of only 20% of our students versus a no, another program that has two or three or four times as many students scattered around the globe. I don't know that that's really a critical mass. What depends more is the, is the relationships you develop with those students and how you stay connected with them. And I can tell you within our program, the connections that I have with former students don't have to do with us bumping into each other on the streets of Denver. Um, because frankly, we're all so busy, we just don't really do that all that much. I keep in touch with students who happen to be in Tennessee. I think he transferred there. His, his wife took a, a doctor position, so he transferred from Southern California. Southern California, we get a lot of, of power people out of California yeah. for some reason. There's some energy regulators in different states that I keep in touch with. Texas, of course, we have. But a lot of our my interaction with the with the students with the alumni tends to be a lot of online on the phone whether they're here in Colorado or not you know so for me it's not like I'm circulating downtown and bumping into some people <laughs> more than others and I can also tell you one thing that people might think when I first thought about this I'm like boy when I do this program couldn't I have sort of like an office hour at a brewery downtown or something once in a while everybody's so busy you never do that so it's really no advantage frankly I mean there's an advantage to being in Colorado don't get me wrong well, I chose to live here for a reason <laughs> but but there's I don't think there's a program specific advantage to being in Colorado because when we're doing the live piece we come together for that weekend and we do it and we're kind of apart yeah, no, absolutely. I think that's great. Yeah, especially, I mean, now with where we are in the world, everything being virtually used for the next few months, everything too. Um, I know Gary talked about that as well. Is, is there anything else you'd like to add to that? I guess kind of as far as the out of state element or, or any examples you can think of with students you worked with that were able to, to utilize that? Well, I would just add about the alumni group itself. You get as much out of that as you put into it. And you know, there's like to Dr. Orlando's point, there's happy hours that take place in Denver that are kind of off the cuff, but there's also scheduled alumni happy hours that are meant to be during cohort weekends. So prospective students or students who just joined get a chance to meet alumni and make connections. The other thing is, you know, depending on the size of the company you work for, it could have offices across the US. So even though somebody's here in Denver, you know, there may be a job opening in 
Texas. And the connection you have is through the program. You ask them about it. You know, I, I'm working with somebody, a, an alumni who's located in Tulsa, that working on utility scale solar projects with them. Um, California, Texas, obviously those areas, they're big energy hubs outside of Denver. And, you know, as your career evolves, there's going to be opportunities outside of Denver. So using, using that as uh, kind of your basis, it's, rel it's a relatively short amount of time, 18 months, and then you're, you're back to being spread out and focusing on your career and your life probably outside of Denver if you're not already here. Yeah, no, absolutely. Well, well, thank you so much. Well, just for the sake of time here, um, we'll go ahead and, and stop here right now. But um, I do see that we had a couple more specific questions that were kind of tailored towards those individuals. I'll make sure to reach out to you for the appropriate resources to help with that. But wanted to thank you again, um, Garrett, as well as um, Dr. Orlando, for your insight and feedback today. And thank you again to everyone here who, who joined us. I hope this was helpful and that you stay safe and continue to be well. Thank you guys so much.